This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Where does the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture come from? It's not from your Bible. In fact, there's a whole lot of things in Christianity that are not in your Bible. We'll get into all of that tonight during the final broadcast episode of Rapture Resurrected with Michael Rood and Dr. Douglas Hamp. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Hey, this is it, the final episode of Rapture Resurrected with Michael Rood and Dr. Douglas Hamp. Now, this is the final uh, broadcast episode, but there is also a bonus episode on the DVD and Blu-ray package that you can pre-order right now at rudeawakening.tv slash rapture, and that will be mailed out to you on August 5th. Now, speaking of dates, we are on the fourth Shabbat of the biblical month of Tammuz on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. You can see it on your screen there. And you can get a copy of that calendar at arudawakening.tv slash calendar. We want to get to our co-host right away this evening because uh, we have a lot to talk about. So please welcome our director of ministry development, David Robinson. David. Well, Scott. Welcome. Good to be here. Yeah. Now, uh, we just published a, a blog of yours, the latest blog, uh, just a couple days ago. And it was all about how um, you need to stick to the plan mm -hmm. because uh, you came here from Missouri, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's a big move. I came here from Canada, so I know how that feels. Right. You come here, and then you kind of have that sort of buyer's remorse type yeah. of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Did I do the right thing? <clears throat> you know, God, do you really want me here? And you went through that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of us in you know our walk face moments in time where we feel like God is calling us to do something, and you know sometimes we question it or whatever. But um, you know, you got to stick to the plan if you really feel like God is calling you to do something. You don't have to have all the answers because we have to remember he's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. So um, a good shepherd would prepare the flock for the sheep. He would go out and make sure that the adder holes had oil uh, placed in them because an adder would come up and bite the sheep. Oh, so if okay. he put oil around the grass, then, uh, you know the scripture that says, I will prepare a place for you to dine amongst your enemies. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a, a reflection of that. And so God would go before us as we go out and he goes and prepares a way for us mm. and he opens he opens the pasture to us if you will to where we can go and move about but if there's something he doesn't want us to do or a place we shouldn't go he normally will put it in our spirit and say stop don't right. do that so we have to depend on him even when we're in the midst of a storm we have to keep our eyes on him like the you know the disciples in the boat they mm. they kept their eyes on him until he got into the boat and then the storm subsided that's very interesting to note so it's you know if you're following the spirit and you're going god I, i'm doing everything you've asked me to do mm -hmm. why am i here we don't even really need to ask that question because he's he's prepared the way, right? And uh, we just walk through it, and we know we're going to get through it. Exactly. And sometimes the storm helps us to focus on the one who called us, ah. the one who gave us direction, the one that told us to go. I mean, if everything was peaches, roses, and cream, and all that, it you know we wouldn't grow from it. So a lot of times we go through things, especially when we make big decisions. A lot of times there's a lot of calamity, if you mm -hmm. will, that will come forth, but it's to keep our eyes focused on Him and know that He has our best interest and He will provide for us. And just like you mentioned with, with the uh, situation with the boat, uh, the key is in our reaction. Not necessarily right. what's happening, but our reaction to it. With Peter, when he kept his eyes on Yeshua, like mm -hmm. you said, he was fine, yeah. but then his reaction to be afraid took it all away. Took it and, all away. And he sank, and then Yeshua had to rescue him. And, right. But Yeshua still rescued him. He did. That's the point. He didn't did. let him drown and say, oh, too bad for you. You didn't believe in me. Exactly. Yeah. So very good. That's, that's very good. You know, we have a testimony today, too, about that. Uh, this is from an anonymous uh, person who wrote into us, and uh, they basically write about how they, they found Michael, and uh, they were overjoyed because they found the truth. They knew it was right all along, and they had gone through some, some junk that we won't go through uh, the the details of, but the, uh, this person says, I love how Yehovah is confirming the purpose of everything we went through. 
Right. And, and it's just, you know, the, the fact that he didn't, didn't save you from everything, mm -hmm. but we had to go through some stuff. Exactly, and if you look back on your own life and think about <clears throat> the achievements that you've been able to achieve, the things that you've been able to achieve, it cost you something. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it wasn't laid in your lap, it wasn't with a silver spoon, you had to invest something into it. Right. And so when we stick to the plan, we invest our faith, we invest our focus on the one who's called us, and, and he's got our back. Right, and I would encourage people that, you know, if, if you're doubting and you're kind of afraid of going, well, how am I gonna know God's with me? Ask him to show you something. Right. You know, when I was going through, everyone uh, who's watching this program for a while knows that I'm from Canada. Mm -hmm. And it took a long process. I've been here for 10 years, finally got the green card, right. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of, there's a lot of uh, stress that goes with that because you're, you're relying on, mm -hmm. you know, the, the government to say whether you can stay here or not. And so I asked God to say, Show me that you're with me during this because I'm just feeling like I'm all alone here. Right. And he gave me a re very simple thing. Uh, and some folks in the office here know about it. And it was a butterfly. Yeah. Every time I would start worrying about the situation, a monarch butterfly would cross my path. Right. No word of a lie. It happened dozens of times, whether mm -hmm. I was just walking around in my office, right. on the freeway. I mean, it would happen everywhere in front of me. And it would sort of just calm my heart going, okay. He's with me. Yeah. And it was just a little symbol that may have meant, meant nothing to somebody else. Right. But because I asked him to show me, uh, you know, basically uh, put out a fleece, mm -hmm. as the saying yep. goes, mm -hmm. he, he was faithful just to do that. He said, you know, I'll humor you. Sure. Yeah. I'll show you a butterfly. When you see the butterfly, you know everything's okay. Yeah, that's good. A lot of times, um, even coming here with the uh, blog we're talking about, and I'm not sure if I put it in there, but there's a, scriptures a lot of times that he'll reinforce to me. Um, and uh, there's a scripture that uh, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Mm -hmm. So it reminds me that I'm going to face turmoil. I'm going to face, if I'm going to walk the path God's put me on, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be things that come forth that can make you doubt, mm -hmm. but stick to the plan and just remember that his promises, looking and leaning on his promises that are in his word. And a lot of us, you know, we can't walk this effectively if we're not in the word. We That's have right. to be in the word. That is our operations manual, yep. you know, to make it through this. And it's funny how we need something in front of us, not just hear, hearing the words okay, but reading it ourselves. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that's the, the focus of when we had a, we have a love gift every month, and this month there's only a couple of days left to get it, and we wanted to tell you about it, and, and the tie-in here is that it, it, it includes the Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, usually we have two levels that we do, right. uh, like a, a fit, gift of $50 or more gets you uh, just the teaching that Michael has, a very exclusive teaching. This one, this month is called Throwing Off the Yoke. We've talked about it for several weeks now. Uh, for the $100 level, you'll also get uh, the God's Blessing. This is uh, parchment. Mm -hmm. parch on parchment. This is the Aaronic Blessing for you, you can display in your home, right. again, a literal right. uh, word in front of you. But for the uh, for a gift of three hundred dollars more, we got something very special this month, and it's a Torah mm -hmm. on a stand that you yes. can display in your home. Put your favorite verse on it, mm -hmm. uh, basically to open up to your favorite verse that has both Hebrew and English. Yes, what a great conversation piece. Yeah, just for people that come in your home. You know yeah. what I mean? Because the scripture tells us we're going to be witnesses. So it's nice to have things in your home that spark conversation mm -hmm. that or uh, surrounded about or talk about the Word of God. So this is a beautiful piece to have. And you know what's funny is, you know, how we put on our favorite verse and someone comes in our home. Mm -hmm. We've seen God operate this before, yeah. where operate in this way before, where someone comes in and looks at your the verse you have displayed and says, oh, I needed to hear that today. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you never know. Exactly. So uh, display it in your home. It's, it's a great thing to have. And again, there's only a few days left to get it. So uh, David, you are primarily responsible for uh, choosing these things for the ministry. So I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. And thank you for it's joining my pleasure. us today. Yes. All right. Well, uh, there is definitely a plan for your life, as David has pointed out today. And all of us collectively, uh, with the rapture that, that is, there is a plan. But it's uh, a little different than maybe what you've been taught in church. Specifically, uh, the timing of the rapture is different. And we will get into that uh, today with the final broadcast episode of uh, Reclaim or Rapture Resurrected with uh, Dr. Douglas Hamp and Michael Rood. This is number, episode number four, and you can also get episode number five, a bonus episode that will not be broadcast, and you can get that when you pre-order the entire series at rootawakening.tv slash rapture. And speaking of uh, bonuses, don't forget that this is the last week to get that uh, this month's bonus love gift. Here's how to get it. Through his resurrection, Yeshua not only paid our death penalty, he forever removed the yoke of man-made rules and regulations, showing us that God's ways are the only ways that matter. Learn about this powerful reality and how it can help you stand up for the Bible today in Michael Rood's exclusive teaching, Throwing Off the Yoke.
We are not satisfied with just a, a simple understanding of the Torah or of the prophets or of Yeshua's teachings. We want him to continue to work in us and continue to teach us so that we do what he has asked us to do. Throwing Off the Yoke is a special gift from Michael Rue to you, available only in July. Own this special teaching right now when you designate a love gift of $50 or more. Or donate $100 or more to receive Throwing Off the Yoke, plus a hardcover Aaronic Blessing on parchment and a pair of Jerusalem Scene Candle Holders. Or as a special bonus, only in July, you can receive Throwing Off the Yoke, the Aaronic Blessing Parchment, the Jerusalem Candle Holders, and a sculpted hardcover Torah with a wooden book stand, all for a gift of $300 or more. The Illuminated Torah is a beautiful showpiece, including all five books of the Torah, written in both Hebrew and English, plus beautiful illustrations and photos of classic artwork and archaeological treasures. Get these amazing gifts now, throwing off the yoke for a love gift donation of $50. The teaching, hardcover parchment blessing, and Jerusalem candle holders for a love gift of $100 or more. Or get everything plus the hardcover illuminated Torah and book stand for a love gift of $300 or more. These gifts are a limited quantity, one-time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support of A Rood Awakening International. Make your love gift donation now to receive these special gifts. Call now or visit monthlylovegift.com. Shalom Torah fans. Thank you for standing with this ministry financially as we broadcast the gospel of the kingdom to the world. Now I want to tell you about an easy way to do it. Text to give. Start a text message and address it to 50155. Then type the word truth as your message. A second later, you'll get a link to fill out your donation. It's that easy. Thanks again for standing with me with text to give The traditions of modern Judaism remind us of what we did during the temple period. Not what we did, but they remind us of what we did. But the followers of Yeshua also have some other traditions, some other things that are reminders of what has been accomplished for us. They are reminders of what goes back long before the temple period, and it reminds us of what happened the very year that Yeshua was crucified and resurrected. At the last supper that Yeshua had with his disciples, the Greek scriptures tell us that he took our tone. He took leaven bread and broke it. Of course, the English, the Greek, and, and all scriptures tell us that this last supper was before the feast of Passover. And the following morning, the Pharisees refused to go into Pilate's judgment hall because they didn't want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. This is not the Passover meal. And every time we serve bread and wine gives us the opportunity, as Yeshua says, as often as you do this. You do this in remembrance of me. And so, as Yeshua said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood. And he spoke the prayer that the Melech Zadik shared with Avraham thousands of years ago. Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Barei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah our Elohim, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua took bread, and he blessed the Most High, saying, Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. As often as you do this, we do this in remembrance of him. L'chaim. Back this week on Shabbat Night Live with Dr. Doug Hamp. And if we could have turned on the cameras an hour ago as we we're just discussing uh, so many of these, uh, these, these topics that have 
changed both of our lives, uh, but we can't roll back time, so uh, we're back here with Doug. Doug, it's so good to have you with us again this week, Shabbat Night Live, and uh, as I've said before, I envy you for the years that you got to spend in Jerusalem at Hebrew University. Uh, you are also, uh, your master's degree in, in biblical studies and in the world of the Bible, the, the culture, the land, the language of ancient Israel, and you as a Gentile, as a pastor, uh, came from America to Israel uh, to, to engage in this very thing. And so many people, you know, tinker on the sides, but you got embroiled, I mean, right in, in the, the heat of the battle at Hebrew University, and uh, then went on uh, your PhD uh, at uh, Louisiana Baptist University, and uh, also you were a professor at uh, the Cavalry Chaparral uh, Bible Graduate School, basically their seminary, yep. and, um, and so you've got a, a world of, uh, of experience that, uh, that you can bring to the table. Now, I understand that this summer you are going to be bringing people together for a conference. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on this summer. Right, so uh, this summer we're gonna have a One in Messiah convocation, so call it a conference if you will, but this is gonna be a family-friendly event, uh, so we're encouraging people to bring their kids, we're gonna have lots of events for the kids, yeah. a bounce house and all that stuff, plus we're gonna have lots of speakers and, uh, and workshops as well, so you can do dance, you can do uh, a crash course in Hebrew, uh, a songwriter's workshop as well. And, uh, and then we're gonna have lots of speakers talking about uh, being one in Messiah, but what does that really mean? The, kind of this idea of the commonwealth of Israel. Um, this is a, a term that a friend and I were looking at, Ephesians chapter two, okay. where, where Paul right. says that um, you are no longer strangers, but you're now, you're now um, citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. And so you think about what is a commonwealth in, in its best sense, okay? A commonwealth, it, like the, the British commonwealth, means that these other countries that were kind of conquered by them, they now become part of this greater entity. Mm -hmm. And so the greater entity that, that we see is the coming together of the two sticks that Ezekiel talks about, or the two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you know, as, I, as I've gone through my studies, this has really been something that has culminated. It's brought everything together for me because now I can, I can see this bigger picture. I can see where the rapture fits. I can see you know, how the end times are gonna play out. I can see um, you know, how the, the relationship that the so-called church has with Israel. All these things come together when we understand this bigger picture of the common wealth of Israel. And that story takes us back to the days of the United Kingdom of Israel. Well, let's go back to that because this definition of terms, this has got to uh, permeate uh, the, the Christian culture, the Messianic culture, the Messianic Jewish, and the, the Hebrew roots culture has got to understand these terms as they're defined in the Bible instead of how it's being defined in, in uh common Christian or Jewish culture today. And I want you to take us through that a little bit. Absolutely, so, you know, again, one of the things is that you, you hear sometimes people say that Abraham was Jewish, but he wasn't. Yeah, yeah, okay. we've, we've heard it uh, right. said, Abraham was the first Jew. Right. And it's like, that is, that is either ignorant or it is defining Jew as, a, as completely outside of the biblical sense, in the historical sense. Right. So take us through that a little bit. Right, so the first Jew would have been Judah, right? So this is the fourth son of uh, Jacob, that's the first Jew, because that's exactly what Jew means, is from someone who's from the tribe of Judah. And uh, you cannot have a Jew before that. So anybody from his tribe would have been a Jew. Now we need to remember that the kingdom split uh, after Solomon, who did not follow in the ways of God. He did a lot of bad things, mm -hmm. and God said, I'm going to take the kingdom out of your hands, I'm gonna snatch it out, I'm gonna give it to somebody, uh, somebody else, and he gives it to Jeroboam. Well, right. and Jeroboam had been a tax protester up north. He had to flee down into Egypt, and then yep. with the death of Solomon, he then is called back out of Egypt up into northern Israel, and that's where the real split happens, correct? Exactly, right, okay. right. And so they come together. Uh, Rehoboam, the king of, and the, of Judah, says, you know, 
everybody come together, let's talk. And he says, you think you had it bad under my dad, it's gonna be even worse under me. And so the Northern Kingdom splits off. This mm -hmm. is called the breach of Jeroboam. This is a, 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 a very important time in the history of Israel. And somehow, I mean, I remember reading it, but just glossing over it theologically, I'm like, well, what does that actually mean? Right, but it's huge. Okay. This, is, this is the big story. Because then some 160 years later, we're gonna have an official divorce between God and the kingdom of Israel. Well, let, let's go back and, and see this, because uh, the 10 northern tribes, they are the ones that become known as Israel, the right. kingdom of Israel, and the king of Israel uh, is, is over this, and, and most of them you know, they're thoroughly paganized. Yes. But the king of Judea, the king over Judea, because the, the main tribe there was Judah. Right. And uh, from King David's line, David, Solomon, and uh, from the throne of David would come the Messiah. And so this is the area of Judea. And so there were Levites that lived there. There were people that they came down from the north after this split. And they came back down into uh, Judea. And so it's not all, uh, all just Jews or those of the tribe of Judah that are living in that area, but this area became, comes known as Judea. That's right. And then, uh, and then uh, of course, just before the Babylonian captivity, we already have the, the split between the nations, that's when the, the term it, that we find in the Bible, the, the terminology first arrives of Jew, which is a short form of Yehudian. Okay, so now, now we, we go, go back up north here, uh, uh, Doug, uh, the, the, the kingdom of Israel, and this divorce, uh, explain a little bit more of that. So the divorce is spoken of very clearly in the book of Jeremiah, chapter three. God says that he gave the house of Israel a certificate of divorce. Uh, he says in the book of Hosea. Right, so, and, and this is uh, this is separate from Judea. That's right. Because Jeremiah was in Judea. He was a priest in the area of Anatot, which is just north of the city wall of Jerusalem. Correct. And, and so this was his main bailiwick. But he is, he is prophesying and he's saying an a fait accompli of what happened to northern Israel in this. Right, exactly. And let me just back up chronologically. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the book of Hosea, where uh, it says, and she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, call her name Lo Ruchama, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. So you okay. see a very clear distinction right. between the two houses. God says, house of Israel, no more mercy for you, Lo Ruchama but to the house of Judah, I'm still gonna have mercy, right? And then uh, there are these other children that are born, okay, and so we see lo ami, not my people, right? Mm -hmm. And who is he talking to? The house of Israel, not the house of Judah. Right. This is so important, so critically important to, to understand what God is doing. And uh, we're gonna see these same references in the New Testament, specifically the book of Romans and in 1 Peter, uh, there both Paul and Peter are now saying that, that the Gentiles are now the fulfillment of the house of Israel coming back in. And so this is a, this is a huge, huge thing. And so uh, it says in, in, um, in Hosea chapter uh, one, verse 10, he says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as a sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, lo ami, there it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. And so again, that's what, what Paul says, and that's what Peter, they both say this in reference to the house of Israel. Right, so there is a prophetic end game that, uh, that, that I, I believe we're, we're now engaging in, but this end game starts back there where uh, we, we can go all the way back to uh, just before the children of Israel, which is, all of Israel, the 12 tribes, uh, cross over the Jordan River and they come into the Promised Land. And Moses there uh, in uh, which I, I call the, the Covenant of Moab because this was different from what we uh, all experienced at Mount Sinai. And, and, and at that time, this is when Moses says, as long as you keep yourself unpolluted from these other nations, you will remain in the land. Right. But if you take on the worship of the heathen and 
and do what they do to serve their gods, then I'm going to throw you out of the land. The land is going to vomit you out. Yes. And so the, the end of that was uh, the, the separation. With northern Israel, they went fully into this pagan sun god worship. Every one of their kings, it, Everything, it's, it's uh, like Jeroboam is the standard. He's the landmark, and everyone is compared with how evil this man is who put a, stat, uh, a, yes. a, a, a statue of uh, the golden calf at Bethel and at Dan, and he said, these be your gods, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so all the paganism that we had, uh, that we were supposed to, divest from the land and we were supposed to clean it up. No, we fully got involved with that and so we literally became not his people anymore. We, we, we got, the, the, the verdict was, I'm divorcing you then. Exactly, and this raises an important point. If they're getting divorced, when did they get married? Well, they got married at Mount Sinai. And it's interesting, when you celebrate the Feast of, of Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks, this is typically considered a marriage event. So God married the, the Commonwealth, the, the United Kingdom of Israel, the 12 tribes he married at Mount Sinai. Now it's interesting to also see that there were a mixed multitude, so there were Egyptians, et cetera, and other nations that were all brought into this. But it's not like the Egyptians remained Egyptian, they were brought into the they were all baptized in the Red Sea. Exactly. They were no longer Egyptians. They right. came out as a mixed multitude, but that mm -hmm. baptism all brought them into the family of God. Right, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful picture. So they get married at Sinai. They basically exchange vows. You know, God says, if, if you'll be faithful to me, I'm gonna bless your socks off. And they say, everything the Lord has said, we will do. All right, so they promise mm -hmm. to be faithful. Sadly, on their wedding night, they're actually uh, you know, sleeping around with other gods. They're going after the golden calf. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> and God's like, whoa, you know, according to our, our marriage agreement, yeah. I could kill you right now. Right, right. And Moses is up in the mountain right. because he's going to receive the commandments in stone. He goes up there and, and first he, he is given the revelation concerning the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle and all this, finally, he is given the tables of stone and he comes back down the mountain and what have we been doing? Right. We've been playing the whore with the Apis and Hathor. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is really helps to understand that when we talk about the old covenant, so-called, uh, the, the old covenant is that first marriage contract. And there was nothing yeah. wrong with the marriage contract, there was something wrong with the wife. Right. Okay, and so the old covenant has been done away with because she broke it she completely uh, went whoring after other gods and, and played the harlot, it was the adulterous wife. So there's nothing wrong with the covenant itself, with, the, the, with that, that marriage vow, but it was with the, in, uh, the infidel uh, party here. Well, and, let, yeah. let, let's, let's talk about that for a minute because when we talk about a marriage vow and the intimacy of the marriage vow, uh, after Moses, after the commandments are shouted down from the mountain, and then Moses was, was told by the people, you know, please, you go up and, and, and speak with God, whatever he tells you, you come back down and tell us, and we'll obey, but we're afraid we're gonna die standing under this fire like this. So Moses goes back up the mountain, he gets additional, six pages in the King James, additional commandments, he comes back down and he writes that on a scroll, and then, they, they sacrifice bulls and then shake the blood of the bulls on the people and on the scroll and on the altar and that is the sealing of the marriage contract. This yes. is what happens uh, when a, a man and a woman come together. There is, there is a blood in that, in that marriage vow, yes. in, in, in that. And so when Moses went up in the mountain and received the tables of stone, we, he came down and we had already broken the blood covenant. Right. The death penalty is the remedy for the blood covenant of uh, being broken. Right. That's the only uh, remedy. Yeah. The, the death of the offending party has to take place. Exactly. And so you get this sense that God's like, okay, I won't, I won't destroy her because I know she's had a tough upbringing and you know, she had an abusive father and all this stuff. So you know, it's like God's showing mercy from day one right? and yeah. he's kind of willing to overlook it. But the problem is Israel never becomes faithful. They never remain faithful. 
And so eventually, God's like, you know what? You are Mrs. Yehovah, and yet, what are you doing? You are sowing my reputation in the community. And so now everybody thinks that I'm okay with your activities. Everybody thinks that I'm okay with your worship to the god Molech and to the sacrificing of these babies and all this stuff that you're doing with Ashtoreth and et cetera. They think that I'm okay with that, I'm not. And so God put up with it for centuries, seven centuries, mind you. He's a yeah. very, very patient God. All right, very patient God for seven centuries he puts up with us until finally he says, you know what, I'm done. I, I can't take it any longer, we're divorcing and I am no longer your God, you are no longer my wife, I will no longer have mercy upon your people. But then as you know, he says, get out of my house, then he says as she's leaving, but one day, one day I'll call you back to me in there righteousness is. and I'll betroth you to me in righteousness forever and you will not call upon the names of the Baalim anymore. You will call me Ishi, my man, my husband. And so you see this wonderful, beautiful thing of endearment, like wow, how is, but how is God gonna do this? Because there's a snafu. Okay, according to Deuteronomy chapter 24, if a man has a, a wife and he sees some ervat uh, devar, some unclean thing in her, then he can give her a certificate of divorce and send her out of his house. And if she becomes the wife of another man and so the same thing happens, that she gets divorced, she cannot go back to the first husband. That would be an abomination and it would greatly pollute the land. So now we have this divine conundrum. How is God going to bring back the one that he divorced who clearly has been with other men, so to speak? She's clearly been an adulterous wife with all these other gods and now she's gonna come back? How can that happen? It's impossible according to Deuteronomy 24, for God to bring back the adulterous wife that he divorced. Unless, there's only one way that we could get out of this, this snafu. And Paul actually has the solution in Romans chapter seven. He says, brethren, you know that if a man has a wife and that if he, uh, if he sends her away, that, that she uh, cannot come back. I'm just gonna pull this up here, Romans chapter seven, because it's such an important passage. He says, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. She's released from the law of her husband, not from, not from the Torah, right? It's not that you know, she gets divorced, oh, now I can go murder people, now I can, I can go and steal. Right. Right, not at all, but she's released from the law of her husband. That's the, the specific Deuteronomy law. <clears throat> right, right, so then, so then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she's married another man. And here's the thing, therefore my brethren, you ha also have become dead to the law, the law of the husband, not the Torah, but the law of the husband, through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So what he does is he divorces the northern kingdom. He says, get out of my house, but I'm gonna bring you back to me one day in righteousness, I'll betroth you to me forever. How can he do that? How does he overcome the divorce certificate that he himself gave her? Is that he, the husband, has to die. The husband has to die, and so then that legal contract is annulled at his death, and she is a part of that, and then when he rises, he's now a new legal entity. He's a new legal entity so that he can now marry her again, and she can be considered a, a virgin daughter because he's now marrying her in newness, <clears throat> not according to the old marriage contract, but now there's a new marriage contract. But, the, but the, the conditions are the same. The Torah, the, the instructions of how to live, those don't change at all. Right, right, well, and that, that's beautiful, Doug, because you know, so many people will use that verse in saying that the Torah is dead, that, that we're, we're free to violate the Torah when that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, it, because it, John tells us this very thing, that sin is a violation of Torah, it defines sin. 
And, and you know, we, we both grew up in a Christian culture that, you know, we had so many rules and regulations that if we did these things or didn't do these things, that was sin. But how freeing it is to be released from the rules and regulations of men and knowing that if we violate the Torah, that's sin. Mm. Okay, and you know, when we're, when we're born again, we no longer want to commit sin. We don't desire to commit sin. We want to be obedient. We have no enmity against the Torah. We have no enmity against God. We, we, we are a, a new creation in that, and we desire to be obedient. Right. Well, we are going to have to continue this and in, in, uh, I want to go back and we're going to go back into these prophecies about Israel and how this is coming to pass to now, uh, right now. So we'll be back in just a minute. Sometimes prophets are instructed to do very hard things to illustrate something to God's people. It was Ezekiel who was told that he was going to be paralyzed and lay on his side. He was going to have to bake bread with his own dung uh, in front of people. And when he complained about it, uh, the Lord said, okay, you can use cow dung. And uh, Hosea, he was told to marry a whore, a prostitute, so that God's plan could be illustrated to his people. Uh, Israel, from that, was divorced from uh, from God, and they were scattered among the nations. They were sifted like wheat among the nations. In other words, you couldn't tell an Israelite who was already involved in the land of Israel in their pagan sun god worship, who was completely contaminated, who lived like the heathen, and so the, when they got scattered out among the world uh, from uh, Shalmaneser and, and, and uh, into the Assyrian Empire and beyond, so that was Israel's lot, that they'd be sifted among the nations, but also we've got a prophecy concerning Judah. Exactly. Yeah, and, and again, maintaining that distinction between the house of Judah and the house of Israel, so important. That when we say that there was a divorce, there wasn't a divorce with Judah, there was a divorce with the house of Israel. And the house of Israel, according to the book of Hosea, that they would be assimilated among the nations. They'd be swallowed up by the nations. So they'd become wanderers among the nations. Uh, think of it like if you take a, a drop of, uh, of uh, red wine and you, you drop it into a glass of water. You know where it went. So it's not lost that you don't know its location, but it's lost in the sense that you can't get that drop out of there. It's now mm -hmm. been commingled with that mixture. And that's the same thing that we're talking about when we say that the 10 tribes have been scattered to the nations. It's not that we're gonna find them behind a mountain somewhere, it's that they have been assimilated, grafted in to the, the nations, the goyim, the ethnos. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. So it, of course it raises this interesting question, what about the Jews? Well, in the book of Jeremiah chapter three, uh, the, the prophet, well, God even himself, he says, so according through the mouth of Jeremiah, they say, if a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, may he return to her again, would not that land be greatly polluted? So this is of course in reference to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And he says, but you've played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me. So he's saying, look, I know what you've done, and according to Deuteronomy 24, we can't get back together, but don't worry about it, come back, I'll take care of the details, all right? And, uh, and then he says that you've done all this lousy stuff, you have uh, been really lousy, and mm -hmm. he says, but return to me, he said this to the house of Israel, but she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel, the northern kingdom, had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear but went and played the harlot also. So why didn't God divorce the north or the southern kingdom of Judah? The reason is because he said, for the sake of King David, right. who was faithful, I'm not going to divorce the southern kingdom of Judah. They deserve it. Oh, do they deserve it, right? They, they're even worse than northern Israel. And as we go through the book of Ezekiel, right. what, what is so striking is that Ezekiel is not sent to the house of Judah but he is sent to the house of Israel. And he said, 
you know, I'm not sending you to people of a hard, hard tongue. I'm sending you to the house of Israel, but they're not gonna listen to you because they don't listen to me. <laughs> and, and then you see when, I when, uh, remember when God picks up Ezekiel by the lock of the hair and takes him over to Jerusalem in a vision. Mm-hmm. And he says, Ezekiel, dig through the wall and what do you see? And he sees all these, um, the, the, these abominable things up on the walls of the temple. He says, see yeah. what the house of Israel has done. And he sees the abominations of the house of Israel. So you, you mentioned in the last segment that, that group, uh, or some, uh, you know, a remnant of the house of Israel did come down south to Judah. But what did they do? They perverted it and they infiltrated the worship in the temple so that God's temple was radically defiled yeah. and they were uh, weeping for Tammuz, they were worshiping uh, Ashtoret or, or uh, Ishtar, the queen of heaven. They were doing that right in the temple. And then God says, you think that's bad? Come here, I'll show you some more stuff. And then you see the, the elders of the house of Israel who are worshiping toward the sun and their backs are to the temple. Yeah, yeah. And God says, should I just not worry about this? I mean, this is <laughs> awful, what's happening? And, and so, this is now, in time of Ezekiel, this Ezekiel is already in the Babylonian captivity, right. Mm-hmm. right? The house of Israel is no longer. They are not a nation any longer. They've already been taken out of their land. And so God still has issues because of what is happening. And he says that I'm going to completely scatter them to the nations. And so that's where we come. And so then we come to some just incredible passages. For example, in 1 Peter, we see that Peter is writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, uh, James makes the same reference. He says to the 12 tribes who were scattered abroad. Well, we know where at least two of the tribes were, maybe three, if you count the Levites. So you've got Judah, you've got Benjamin, You've got the Levites, we know where they are. And you know, we do hear about uh, uh, the, uh, the prophetess who's in the temple, uh, Anna, right? She is from Asher, right? So we do mm-hmm. hear remnants mm-hmm. of different people. Right. But as a community, it's only the house of Judah that remains. The house of Israel is no longer. So putting this all together, what happens to Judah now? If, if the northern kingdom of Israel has been sent away, divorced, and God's like, just get out, what about Judah? Judah certainly deserved to be separated, but because of David, God would not do it. So the new covenant, uh, the death of Jesus on the cross, it makes a way to resolve the, mer- the divorce certificate, to take that out of the way for the northern kingdom of Israel. But let's face it, Judah was an adulterous, slutty wife. And so now you have this terrible stain, this stigma over this marriage, and God's like, you know what? I'm just gonna cancel this whole first marriage contract and we're gonna start a new one. So that that both adulterous and divorced Israel and adulterous but not divorced Judah can both get a fresh start. They can both get a fresh start, they can both come back together as one new man instead of the two, there shall, there shall no longer be two sticks, but there'll be one in my hand. There will not be two nations ever again, but there'll be one nation, according to Ezekiel chapter 37. And this was all taken, uh, this was all made possible by the cross, by the death of Jesus, the death of the husband, and then the, re, uh, or the resurrection of that husband that happened at the cross. This now permits a new marriage contract and so, so my opinion is that it's a completely new marriage contract. It's a completely new covenant. Now, the, the stipulations of the covenant are the same. I mean, the, the, the things that you're supposed to do in that marriage, in the context of the marriage, you're still mm-hmm. supposed to be faithful. You're still not supposed to murder people. You're still not supposed to steal. You're supposed to still keep the Sabbath, et cetera, because that hasn't changed. Because the, the, the Torah is really uh, God's value set. He's like, these are the things that I value. And God doesn't change, so his values right. don't change. Mm-hmm. So of course, his instructions to humanity would not change. But as far as the, the marriage contract, it got sullied and messed up, not because of God doing anything wrong, but because of the wife who did something wrong. 
And we see this in Ezekiel chapter 16, and we see it all over the place where God is using this, this, uh, this uh, illustration of the marriage to talk about it, and then the divorce, and then the remarriage. And so, just very quickly, let me just bring this, really, bring this home here. And he says, um, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So who is Peter talking to? He's speaking specifically to the house of Israel because these same words were used in Hosea chapter one to speak to Israel, who God said, you are not my people, lo ami, I'm gonna cast you out, but I'm gonna bring you back. And this is the fulfillment. And so let's bring this right up into Yeshua's words. I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. And then he says to his disciples, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is at the end of the instructions, uh, you will not go through the, the, the cities of Israel before I come. How can that be? We're not talking about the physical Israel. We're not talking about the Galilee and Judea. We're talking about where Israel has been sent and scattered among the nations. Mm. This is what Yeshua is saying. You, you will not complete that job of taking my word and preaching the gospel of the kingdom that I'm preaching, not the prosperity gospel, not the grace perversion, but the, the very gospel of the kingdom that I'm preaching, that I'm sending you out to the entire world you will have not gotten to everyone before I come again. Yeah. And so he's talking about this with the house of Israel that has been scattered. And this has to be, has to be understood. Now we go into what, in Yeshua's ministry. Uh, after, after Passover and his bap, the, the baptisms that they were doing in Judea, and this is uh, uh, John chapter two and three, and John chapter four now, uh, Yeshua leaves Judea when he finds out that the Pharisees now know he's making more disciples and baptizing more disciples than John was. To avoid a premature confrontation with the Pharisees, he departs and goes into the Galilee. 18 hours north of Jerusalem, that's where Mount Gerizim is, and this is uh, where Yeshua meets the Gentile Samaritan woman at the well. Mm -hmm. And this is the first and the only time in his entire ministry that he ever tells anyone that he is the Messiah. Uh -huh. And he says it to a a Samaritan, a Gentile. All the Jews, why do the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Because the Jews know that these people were the, the Gentiles that Shalmaneser brought in to fill the village of the Israelites who were sent into exile. Right. And so now you've got these Gentiles there, Yeshua then speaks to this woman and, 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 uh, and, 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 and tells her something that she doesn't quite understand. Uh, he says, uh, you know, God desires those to worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman didn't understand, and so she gives the, the typical answer, well, I know when the Messiah comes, he's gonna tell us everything. You know, it's like, okay, I, I don't quite get this, worship in spirit and truth, but I know when the Messiah comes, he's gonna tell us everything, and Yeshua says, you're looking at him, sweetheart. Right. I am the Messiah. Yep. From and, and any other time, he forbid anyone from saying he's a Messiah. His disciples, he said, don't tell anyone. I must go up to Jerusalem and I will be then delivered in the hands of the Gentiles and the Gentiles will kill me. And so here it is, Yeshua is, is revealing himself to this Gentile woman. She goes back into the village, you know, yelling, getting everyone's attention, and they come out, and it says that the uh, the, the high priest of the Samaritans was uh, uh, Yohanan at that time, and he, he said, uh, um, we heard the woman, we heard what she said, we didn't believe her. We've heard your words, we know you are the Messiah, you're the savior of the world. And Yeshua then spends two days with those Gentiles. Twice it says he spends two days a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Wow. You know, this is the time of the Gentiles, the time of reaching out to Israel, scattered among the nations right. and calling them in. Yes. And that is why both of us, are, you know, as we were talking before, uh, before our, our set here, it's like we're seeing this miraculous calling of people that are just being called to the Torah, called to the feast, called to the Sabbath, people that are absolutely Gentiles and 
all their upbringing, yet their, their, their heart is being called and they're being called into this, into this marriage. Right, right, and, and this is what is so uh, astounding is that we now have an identity because before we, we, we've, we've been told that, well, we're the church, we're not, we're not, we have nothing to do with Israel, you know, we're the church. Or sometimes uh, in replacement theology, it's, well, the church has now replaced Israel. And both of those are, are equally wrong. And, for, and they're right. both bad for their own reasons. But now we understand that we're kind of like the little brother that woke up. You know, we're that prodigal brother that said, hey, dad, give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. And we go do what our riotous living and you know we find ourselves eventually living like a pagan gentile. Exactly, just and, happy with it, right? Until we're we're finally you know hanging out with the pigs. We're like, I wish I could eat what the pigs are eating. And then we wake up and we say, Wait a second! In my father's house, you know the servants eat better than this. I think I'll go back there and I'll just say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Just make me a servant. The father has his arms wide open, and he brings the son back in because he was lost and now he's been found. That is exactly what God said he was going to do with the house of Israel. He said that I myself will go out and look for them. I will be the shepherd who will bring them in. That's what he said. He says this in Ezekiel, that I myself, God says, I myself will go out and get them. And then here comes Yeshua, looking for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now what about that older brother? presumably older, the one who stayed home and has right. a bad attitude. Hey, I've been doing everything you've been saying to do, right? And he's like, yeah, son, everything that I have is yours. And so Judah, who has been, by and large, I say that very generally, but by and large, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, right. more or less. Both okay. of us know that very well, <laughs> well by and large. <laughs> sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, at least in pretense, they've been keeping the Torah, okay, uh, with a few ad added uh, things in the Talmud, right? But, uh, but they're like, you know, hey, why did I get to go out and party? Son, everything that I have is yours. So, th so they, their relationship with the Father is messed up as well because they don't realize what they have in God. They don't realize this wonderful relationship of grace, of joy, of peace that they have, and they're kind of jealous of the other brother who went and squandered all the money. And this is what we see when God's gonna bring them together in the gathering uh, we saw that in Isaiah chapter 11, that he will gather the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and there'll be no more infighting between them, right? All that, that fighting between Ephraim and Judah, that's gonna all go away. That's in Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, so this is the big story, and yet somehow this has been glossed over, and so many of us are just like, how did we miss this? But we, we believe that, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the goyim, of the fullness of the nations, which is exactly what uh, Jacob prophesied over Ephraim and Manasseh, right? He crossed his hands, just was mm -hmm. like, hey, dad, don't do that. He's like, no, no, son, I know what I'm doing, all right? Yeah, Manasseh's gonna be great, but Ephraim, oh yeah. And he says that he will be meloha goyim, he'll be the fullness of the Gentiles. That's the exact phrase that Paul uses in Romans chapter 11. Uh, Doug, we're gonna have to uh, c continue on. You, you have so many materials, uh, things that we wanna cover, and I wanna have you back on. We're gonna do something special, and so we can give people an overview of this and uh, also a little bit more about what's gonna happen with the conference. Will you do that with me? I'd love to. Okay, well, shalom Torah fans. This has been a wonderful uh, event with Doug here with us uh, for the last few weeks of Shabbat Night Live. Uh, join us uh, in the the special edition that we're going to do here uh, because there are a lot of treasures uh, from his life, from his ministry that we didn't even begin to touch during this week uh, and during the, these weeks that we've been uh, doing Shabbat Night Live. So I'd like to pray. Yivarechecha Yehovah vayishmeracha. Yair Yehovah panavelecha vichunacha. Yisa Yehovah panavelecha vayisam lecha shalom. Basham Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name, under the authority of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen and amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, Shavuot Tov, have a good week and we'll see you back here next time on Shabbat Night Live. Lehitro, bye-bye.